Is I think okay, we got it. Praise God. Well, good morning, everybody. This is an exciting time, and this subject is near and dear to my heart. I've been uh, wrestling with this, praying about it. It's been revolutionizing the way I see my faith and my life for 20 or more years now. So I want to try to share some of that with you today. Uh, today, as we continue our Frequently Asked Question sermon series, we come to one of the most frequently asked questions of all. Now, I was just thinking the question that would have been burning in the hearts of Nathan, Camille, and the boys if there had been a little different outcome on the World Cup final, <laughs> they wouldn't probably be here this morning because <laughs> an hour from now, it's going to be, well, too bad not Brazil and France, but Croatia and France. So our frequently asked question today is far more important and infinitely more important than, than <laughs> who's going to win the World Cup. Um, our frequently asked question will profoundly affect every aspect of your life, both now and in all eternity. We're going to look at the question as, who is Jesus? Is he really the great creator? And if so, how can we know that from scripture? Everything you do, think, and experience will be impacted by how you answer this question. One day, you will meet the Lord Jesus face to face. Amen? Amen. You, will you be ready for that day? Will you be ready to enter into glory in the eternal kingdom of God? This is a very weighty question. Now in a frequently asked question series, it's very important to wrestle some of the issues. We've said before, if you want to build your faith to be strong, you've got to ask the hard questions. You've got to engage your mind. You remember the rabbis, uh, the uh, disciples went to Jesus and said, Rabbi, Master, what is the greatest commandment? And you know his answer. He said, you shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with your soul, and your mind. This is the great and first commandment. So our question we want to focus on today is, who is Jesus? He claimed to be God. So the hard question for us today is, how do we know that? Where does the Bible teach that? <clears throat> you ask your um, friends, your Mormon friends, uh, Muslim friends, Jehovah's Witness, your Unitarian Universalist friends, your agnostic unbeliever friends, what are they going to say about Jesus? Well, he was a prophet, he was a teacher, a god, a god, a godlike man, maybe a blasphemous curse word. Always amazed me, but why do people curse in Jesus' name? Did you ever hear anybody curse in Buddha's name or Muhammad's name or Mother Teresa's name? Why Jesus? And I don't know, but it could be that little flea-sized man stupidly is shaking his fist in the face of Almighty God. I don't know. So some years ago, I was a... Um, pilot with Pan Am. Anybody remember Pan American World Airways? At the time, some of my Mormon and Muslim friends, I was in discussion with them, and I was wrestling with the question, how can we know Jesus is God? Because they would complain, they would argue that he's not God. He's just some sort of elevated being, a great teacher or something. So I was praying, this was long before I had a chance to uh, go to Bible school and study. I was praying, uh, Lord, give me some resolution on this. And uh, so often when you've prayed for something a long time and the Lord finally answers, it's like, wow, thank you. So I was able to go to a conference up north for five days for about 300 pilots airline pilots and flight attendants from all over the world. I didn't know what the subject was going to be. Uh, the, day, the morning started out of this five-day conference. The speaker, what is the first thing he said? He said, Jesus is God. Wow. He spent an hour or so on that first message saying that Jesus claimed to be God, his enemies claimed he was God, the scriptures claim he's been God. And at the end of that first hour, he said, so what? What difference does it make in my life that Jesus is God? And then he had four more series of messages for the rest of the week. It says, he said, because Jesus is God, then it follows that Jesus is worthy of my worship. 
That's total dedication. You find yourself kind of flowing for life through life and needing a focus. If Jesus is God, that's the foundation of everything. He said, uh, Jesus, if Jesus is God, he has absolute right to lordship over my life. He's the boss, not me. Gives your life purpose and focus. And he said, um, if Jesus is God, why is this subject so important? It follows that he's the only way of salvation. Here we're sending our sister Susan to Hungary. Does it make any sense? Is it not pompous and arrogant and politically incorrect that we send her and say Jesus is the only way? He's the solution. If Jesus is not God, we have no message. Let's go home. Uh, if Jesus is God, do you need power and for living? He gives you everything you need to do what he calls you to do, amen? So this is a very important subject. <clears throat> now, I like to tell the story some years ago, I knew a Swiss miss. <laughs> well, not that type of Swiss miss, that type of Swiss miss. And uh, she came with me on different occasions to some great evangelical church services up north. She and I usually spoke German with each other, and after a particularly good service, she was saying to me, Ich verstehe euch nicht, ihr seid so begeistert von Jesus. Jesus is so fada. Now, when you speak in tongues, you've got to interpret, so. <laughs> <coughs> what was she saying? She said, I don't understand you people. You're so excited about Jesus. And she said, Jesus is so fada. I didn't know the word at the time, the German word Fada, it's kind of like a word fade. So what was she saying? She says, Jesus is so boring, insipid, uninteresting, bland. I said, what? Which Jesus are we talking about? And I was thinking, um, could it be possible, could it be possible that the Swiss Miss did not know that Jesus is the creator of the universe? He spoke. And billions of stars and galaxies came into existence. Could it be that the Swiss Miss did not know that Jesus, the Creator, made the horse and the Tyrannosaurus Rex and the humpback whale and people? It wasn't goo to you by the way of the zoo from the scum ponds that we got here. Amen. Jesus is the creator. Jesus boring, uninteresting? No way. Could it be the Swiss Miss didn't know that Jesus made the kumquat and the pomegranate and the raspberry and the rice family favorite, the strawberry, amen? Could it be the Swiss Miss, could it be that you did not know Jesus made the palm tree, and the putty cat, and the puppy dog. Amen? Amen. Jesus, boring, uninteresting? No way. Jesus is God. He made everything. How can we know that from Scripture? That's what we're going to look at today in just three phases of this message. First, we want to look at the Old Testament background really understand what the New Testament is teaching, what's happening there, we've got to see from the Old Testament perspective. And we're going to look at some Facebooks from the Gospel of John. You didn't know Facebook was there? They had Facebook back then? And then we're going to close up with call what we call full mentioned text. Where does the Bible clearly teach on a subject? So this understanding that we'll have from the Old Testament is really going to help brighten up our understanding of the New Testament. So you remember back in Old Testament history that um, Moses, the leader of the Jews in Egypt, came to God and said, hey, all the false gods have names. You're the true God, what's your name? And what was God's answer? Kind of strange what he said. He says, I am that I am. He said, say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. What is God saying there with this I am? 
when it finally started to dawn on me what is wrapped up in that I am, it just totally revolutionized how I see the God whom we worship. God is saying, I am the only uncaused cause in the universe. Everything else in the universe has to have a cause. God has no cause. He is the prime mover of all the universe. He's eternally existent. God says, I have no beginning. I have no end. I am uniquely self-sufficient. I'm the only God. The job is not for auction to anybody else. I'm the almighty creator. That's all wrapped up in when, when God says, I am the I am. Uh, in Exodus 3, this I am saying God is transcendent over time, matter, and space. Forget this uh, be me up, Scotty. God is way, way, way beyond that. Transcendent over time, matter, and space. So back in uh, uh, time there, uh, God, uh, Moses goes to God with a high question and asks him this question. So he said, um, God, in the next verse, God says, say to the people of Israel, the Lord, what's the Hebrew there? Yahweh, Yahweh or Jehovah, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. So um, anybody know whenever you see all caps, in our English Bibles in the Old Testament, what word comes up from the Hebrew? Yahweh. Yahweh, exactly. And how about capital L, small o-r-d? Adonai, or Lord, yeah. So it's important to keep that in mind. The, old transla the translators usually put that code in there for our benefit. So how do we tie these two verses together? Verse 14, God is saying, I am, has sent me to you. Verse 15, the Lord, Yahweh, has sent me to you. So wrapped up in the name Yahweh is the concept of I am. So this is very important. We'll see this in a minute. Um, Charlie, I, I came across a song in my mind a little bit too late for today. Maybe we can sing it in the future. But you, some of the songs we sang really were kind of telling the story. I was tempted to say after we sing, finished singing, amen, let's go home. That's good. We got enough. <laughs> so, but this song, uh, some of you may know it. This is the first verse. It kind of tells all what we're talking about today. Down from his glory, ever living story, my God and Savior came. Jesus was his name. Born in a manger to his own, a stranger, a man of sorrows, tears, and agony. Anybody know that song? Well, brothers and sisters, if you really come to the point in your life to grasp who Jesus is as the creator and the savior, then with all your heart you could sing the chorus of this song. With all your heart you could say, oh how I love him, I adore him, my breath, my sunshine, my all. The great creator became my savior. Is that your testimony today? Amen. That's the whole story of the Bible right there. The great creator became the savior. And all God's fullness dwells in who? Jesus. Amen. Aren't you glad we have a Savior? Amen. I've said this before, but um, if you went to a big convention hall with representatives from every religion on planet Earth, and they all have their own booth, and you go up kind of like Rodney Dangerfield <laughs> to each booth and say, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a sinner. I've offended an infinite holy God. I've got a huge, huge problem. I can't fix this problem. I'm looking for a savior. I need a savior. Do you have a savior? You go to every religion in the world and you ask them that. What are they all going to say? Well, we're very sorry. We have imams. We have gurus. We have self-help guides. We have teachers, but we have no savior. Brothers and sisters, can you praise the Lord with me that we have a Savior? Amen? Amen. Some years ago, I met a guy that really got this down cold. I was a uh, crew member with um, Pan Am on a Mexico City layover. So you remember Pan Am with the white hats? 
So there was a Mexican city, uh, Mexican city um, limo driver, Mexican man, very nicely dressed, three-piece suit. So we all pile into his limo. I was sitting in the front seat and the other two pilots in the back seat. I looked down right between us and there's a big Thompson chain reference study Bible in Spanish. So in my limited uh, Spanish, forgive me, brother, uh, I said, Conoces el Señor? Do you know the Lord? And he says, si, si, si. So we had this animated conversation in my limited Spanish. I think he told me he's one of 19 brothers and sisters, kind of to rival Ed and Susie. Um, he was the only one that knew and walked with the Lord. So in Spanish, I asked him, do you know the meaning of Jesus or Jesus. Without a moment's hesitation, he answered right back to me. What did he say? Yahweh is Salvador. He got it. He knew it. The Lord is Savior. That's the meaning, fundamental meaning of Jesus. So how do we get that? Where does that come to from? We'd been talking about the I am Yahweh. Who's the Yahweh? He's the great infinite God of the universe. And there's a name um, in Hebrew, Yahashua. How do we say that in English? Joshua. <laughs> same meaning again, same, same type of name. Yahweh, the Lord who saves. A short version of that, Yeshua. Okay, uh, how would the uh, Messianic uh, Jewish believer say Jesus the Christ in Hebrew? Yeshua HaMashiach. So what do we have in English? Jesus. So there's a lot of meaning in that name. I think back when uh, the angel came to Mary and she said, Mary, you're going to bear a child and you shall call his name Jesus or Yeshua. Why, why this name? What's the, what's the meaning of that? Well, because he's the Savior. He will save his people from sin. Brothers and sisters, Jesus saved me from my sin. I'm eternally grateful not only from the penalty of sin, but the power of sin, that I can overcome sin in my life today. Praise God, is that your testimony? Jesus is the Savior. So let's move on to the heart of the message today. Jesus is God. How can we know that? Uh, we're going to look now at the uh, Facebook paste post from John. As you know, in our New Testament, we have four Gospels written for four different purposes to four different audiences, highlighting the four different sides of Jesus. We're going to look at just in, the, in John for the Facebook post. So this is just kind of give you a little feeling of how do the people of Jesus' day understand what he was claiming, who he's claiming to be. Let's look at John 5. The Jews were persecuting Jesus. Why? Because he was healing on the Sabbath. Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. Now, we'll see in a moment, they took great offense at that. I've said that God is my father, and nobody wanted to uh, kill me, or even worse, fate than death, unfriend me on Facebook. <coughs> so what, what was the deal here? In uh, verse 18, the text says, This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. I don't know if whether Jesus was speaking Aramaic or Greek at the time, but whatever. The people, what did they understand from what he was saying? And the Greek is idion patera. He was somehow claiming a unique relationship with the Father that would make him equal with God. Moving on in uh, verse uh, 24, Jesus says some pretty bizarre things to the hearers of his day. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe, believe what? I am he. Who's he? Who is I am? Yahweh. You will die in your sins. That's a pretty weighty thing to say. What did he say in verse 28? Jesus said to them, when you lifted up the Son of Man, what does that mean? When you crucified Jesus on the cross, 
then you will know, know what? I am he. You remember the Roman soldier that witnessed the crucifixion of, crucifixion of Christ? What did he say? Surely this man was the Son of God. So we see from these Facebook book posts that um, as Yahweh in the Old Testament said, I am the I am, Jesus is making that same claim. Just uh, look at another one in John here. The Jews said, are you greater than our father Abraham? They're trying to understand what he's saying, what he's claiming. Who do you make yourself out to be? Just who are you, Jesus? Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews said, you're not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham? Now this one here, truly, truly, I say to you, every time Jesus says truly, truly, that's in Greek, it's amen, amen. It's like, you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is claiming to be the great I am. And the last one from John, another uh, statement here from Jesus, I and the Father of one. How did they respond? <clears throat> The Jew, they, they picked up stones to stone him. Jesus said, why do you want to stone me? And Jews answered, it was not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. Very clear understanding of, of the, of, from his contemporaries of what Jesus was claiming to be. The contemporaries of his day the enemies of Jesus' day knew exactly who he was claiming to be. He was claiming to be the infinite God of the universe who came into time and space, took on human flesh like we have flesh and bones, and what? Walked on the planet he created. That was the claim he was making. How do we know from the full mention text? Okay, what's a full mention text? If you think you want to go into the scriptures and find about Great teaching on love. What chapter comes to mind? Okay, great. And you think about the heroes of the faith? <laughs> Hebrews 11. Okay, full mention text. Where are the full mention texts of the deity of Christ? Fortunately, they're all chapter 1s. John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1. <clears throat> Let's just look at some of these. They're really powerful. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. So, Nathaniel, guess what? Jesus made the strawberry. Are you thankful to Jesus? <clears throat> and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who's the Word? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. Now, let's say your Jehovah's Witness friends come to you and they open up the New World Translation Bible, the New World Mistranslation, and you got so, well, what am I going to answer this question? What does their text say? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. So, brothers and sisters, you don't need to know a word of Greek. Just look over two verses later, and what does it say? In the New World Translation, all things came to existence through him. Apart from him, not even one thing came into existence. Guess what? That's the definition of the one and only true God. If you make everything that exists, by de definition, you are God. You're not a God. You are God. <clears throat> So the Bible teaches that Jesus was, was, not, was not made or created. He made everything. This is the most vital part of the definition of who the true God is. There can only be one God. Let me get back on track here. <clears throat> so this, this is the way it should read. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God. <clears throat> now... Often people will say, 
oh, there's a big difference between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Well, let's take a little deeper look at that. That's not true whatsoever. It's the same God, greater manifestation, but of the same God. If you study back through the Old Testament, particularly in the original languages, there's two words uh, describing Yahweh that come up over and over and over and over again. You know what they are? Grace and truth. In the Hebrew, hesed wa emet. Loving kindness and truth. Guess what? That's God, Yahweh of the Old Testament. This same God shows up in the New Testament. And what did we just read about Jesus? Full of grace and truth. <coughs> same God, greater manifestation of the same God. Looking over to Colossians, this is another one some of our um, non-believing skeptic friends can stumble on, but what does it say? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. You want to get to know God? Get to know Jesus. Amen. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. What are we saying that the definition of God is he's the creator? Jesus made everything. This is exactly what it means to be God. So what are your um, dear friends going to say about this verse? They're going to focus in on the text that says, he is the image of God, the firstborn of all creation. So they say, see, he's born. That must mean he was created and he can't be God. So how do you answer that? Well, in Greek, firstborn can have two meanings. The word is prototakos, prototakos. It can say first in birth order. Where were you in birth order, Ed? Number 10. Number 10. Okay, praise God. Um, or it can mean, depending on the context, preeminent, first in rank. So um, here you look in Luke, and uh, Jesus is fully God, fully man. So Mary gave birth to, what is, to whom? Firstborn. Prototakis. All right, that's the, the human side of Jesus. Here in Colossians, we're looking at his divine side. Jesus is the firstborn, same word, prototakis, over what? All creation. So we have wonderful family here. Bronco Domofsky has five daughters. The oldest is Alexa. The youngest is three-year-old Serafina. In the Bronco's family, who is the prototakis? The firstborn, Alexa, three years old. How old was John F. Kennedy when he became president of the United States? 43. So let's just imagine 40 years in the future. Serafina is the POTUS, the president of the United States. President Serafina Domofsky. Who's the prototokos now? Who's first in rank? Hail to the chief, Serafina. The preeminent one. If she comes to Bellevue to visit her parents, guess what, Charlie? We're grounded. 30 miles around here, no fly zone. If we take off, they're going to shoot us down. Why? Because the Prototakis, the POTUS, president is in town. Until she goes back to Washington, we're grounded. So you see the difference between the two. Um, Jesus, uh, in one sense, firstborn birth order, but in the other sense, firstborn overall creation, he's the preeminent one. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Hebrews, there we go. Just taking a quick look at Hebrews, the final of our full mentioned text. What a resume. Can you imagine someone you're interviewing for a job and this is his resume? Jesus created the world. He's the radiance of the glory of God the exact imprint of his nature, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Amen. Amen. Is that powerful or what? C.S. Lewis, uh, I was thinking about him, great writer and, um, from back in the 40s, said, when you have done the things that Jesus has done and said the things he said, 
and not be who you claim to be, there's only three possible chances. He said, don't give me this patronizing nonsense about Jesus just being a good teacher. You can't have done and said the things he said and not be who you are. There's only logically three choices. Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or he's the Lord of the universe, and we all need to fall down and worship him. Amen. Amen. So, as we conclude here, you may be struggling with this whole idea of how the infinite God of the universe could take on flesh and enter into time and space, humble himself. Well, there's a story that may have be helpful. It's a story of a man, a husband, who was very skeptical about this whole thing. He, his wife and kids were strong believers, so one day up north where they lived, there was a huge blizzard. So the wife and kids bundle up in the car and off they went to church. And the skeptic husband stayed at home. So he's looking out the big plate glass window of his living room and there were seagulls out there that were getting plummeted by the ice and the sleet and the rain and the snow and the winds. And he took pity on them. He said, how can I help these birds, these seagulls? And uh, he bundled up, he walked outside, he went to his barn, opened up the doors, turned on the lights, and said, hey guys, come into the shelter. Well, what are the seagulls thinking? Who's this guy? He looks pretty frightening to us. No thanks. So he finally had to give up. Turned out the lights, closed the barn doors, walked back to his house, sat down in his living room. And he was just thinking about it, and he said, you know, is it so much of a stretch to imagine that the infinite God of the universe who spoke and life came to be could not humble himself and take on the likeness of man? If that man, as he was thinking, could have become a seagull and talked seagull talk eye to eye with the seagulls, they said, hey guys, come here. There's shelter. Follow me. So that may be helpful to think about Jesus, how he humbled himself and became our savior. <clears throat> so as I close today, I want to just speak to the precious gospel. What's the gospel? It's the good news about Jesus. Before you can really understand how good the good news is, you gotta know how bad the bad news is. The scriptures say that all of us have sinned. That's bad and fall short of the glory of God. And guess what? The bad news gets worse. The wages, the payment that we deserve is eternal death. Bad news, is that bad news? Amen. But the good news, the good news, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever trusts in him should not perish but have eternal life. What does it mean to trust in Jesus? Years ago, I was a uh, flight engineer on a big Airbus plane, and we were flying from Kennedy down to Barbados, 254 passengers. Hurricane Hugo was down in the waiting force down there. Lots of nervous passengers coming on that plane that day down the jetway. I was standing by the entrance. Now, if you walk in as a passenger on a plane, and you come through the door, do you take a left turn or do you take a right turn? First class or business class, no. Uh, do you take a left turn and you walk into the cockpit and say, excuse me, I'll be flying this airplane tonight. <laughs> and the captain looks at you and says, well, who are you? Do you know how to do this? Or do you take a right turn and go back to your assigned seat and in that act, you place your trust, your confidence and the pilot and the airplane to safely get you through the stormy night to the other side. What is that Jesus asking us to do? To put our trust and confidence in him as the savior that he will get us safely through the stormy night into eternal glory. You can become a believer the moment you stop trusting in what you can do for God and you start trusting what he can do for you. Amen? The day is coming that we will all meet the Savior face to face. Are you ready for that day? Are you ready for eternity? I want to tell you, has Jesus, the great creator, become your Savior? 
I want to exhort you, brothers and sisters, if you don't know the Savior, run, don't walk. His arms are open wide. Come to the Savior today. He will save you. He will carry you through to heaven and glory on the other side. Amen? Amen. Join me as I pray.